Hey there, friends. It's David D. from PRM, uh, and that is Joshua from New Progressive Voice. And this is Progressive Talk. This is episode six, and we have a lot of things on the docket today. Uh, we're going to talk about Justin Amash, Trump's impeachment, uh, some uh, Andrew Yang, UBI talk, Mike Revelle talk. So stick around. You're going to want to watch the whole video. So... Joshua, Justin Amash. Have you ever heard this name? I bet you haven't. This is the first time. Apparently, yeah. he's one of the first among the Republicans to come out and openly talk about impeaching Donald Trump. Is that correct? Yes. And yeah, he's and he's also one of the only Congress people to have fully read the unredacted Mueller report, which basically gave him this conclusion that Trump obstructed justice and he needs to be impeached. I'm reading from his Twitter account, and he says, here are my principal conclusions. Number one, Attorney General Barr has deliberately misrepresented Mueller's report. Number two, President Trump has engaged in impeachable conduct. Number three, partisanship has eroded our system of checks and balances. And number four, few members of Congress have read the report. There you go. What do you what do you make of it? Hmm. You think people will follow in his footsteps? My biggest question is, are people going to follow in Amash's footsteps? And remember, Amash is in the Freedom Caucus. He's in the Libertarian Caucus in the Republican Party uh, who are very they're very constitutionally driven. OK, they're very rule of law driven. They're supposed to be. Um, but when I think of Louis Gohmert and I think of Jim Jordan and all these sycophants, mm -hmm. I don't see them really following Amash's lead. Is 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 Amash all alone on this? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is so hard to tell. I know. Um, I do believe there are still a number of Republicans who are level-headed, believe in justice. I do think that through time you'll start seeing them trickle in. So he has stepped forward courageously to set an example. So I do think that in time you're going to start seeing that. That's just my feeling on it. What, what's your take? Do you think that's going to encourage others to come forward? Yeah, I think it will come down to how many people need to, uh, how many people have read what he's read. Because obviously the context right. is here is that he's read the unredacted version and he's just like coming out with it. I wonder if this will be a, a, a normal response by mm -hmm. Congress people who read the unredacted Mueller report. Um, it's just, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell right now, but it, it's still encouraging that at least one, Jesus, at least one G sitting uh, GOP Congress person has come forward um, and that's beat Nancy Pelosi. So uh, what does that say? I never got the sense that Nancy Pelosi was in it for doing the right thing. You know, I really think for her, it's about her agenda. It's about getting reelected. It's about raising funds for the DNC. Um, she believes she's the great strategist, but when it all comes down to it, she's probably the, the worst thing that could have ever happened to the Democratic Party. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to just really quickly throw this in at you and see your analysis of the way Donald Trump responded, knowing the way he typically responds. He responded on Twitter by stating, never a fan of Justin Amash, a total lightweight who opposes me and some of our great Republican ideas and policies just for the sake of getting his name out there through controversy. If he actually read the biased Mueller report, <laughs> biased, <laughs> composed by atering angry Dems who hated Trump, dot, dot, dot. What do you think about that? <laughs> he would see that it nevertheless, it was nevertheless strong on no collusion and ultimately no obstruction. Where did it say? Okay, I don't know where he's getting that from. Anyway, how do you obstruct when there is no crime? And in fact, the crimes were committed by the other side. Justin is a loser who sadly plays right into our opponent's hands. This guy's a president? Jesus God. Hmm. I think we talked about this in one of our, our previous progressive talks when we were discussing if a person did not actually commit a crime, what is their recourse? Uh, would they behave in a similar fashion to Donald Trump and would that justify their behavior? 
And your conclusion on that, I think, made a lot of sense. Can you kind of summarize that in a quick couple sentences? About his behavior. You want to know about his behavior. Right, how he's reacting to this. I mean, you don't go and undermine the uh, institutions of justice. I mean, any man, any everyday common citizen would be thrown in prison. Um, that Some would even be called treasonous. You're implying a two-tiered justice system, I think. Exploiting the two-tiered justice system where there's no accountability for people like Donald Trump. Right. And, and he's fully exploited it. He just, he just doesn't, every day, there could be something that could be categorized as literal obstruction. It just doesn't matter. Um, he knows it's a two-tiered system. He knows he's not going to be held accountable. Uh, and he's just having a field day with it. Yeah, I think that one of the things you said uh, a couple of progressive talks back, which really hit home with me because I was struggling with this. Uh, and I think I can understand why Donald uh, Trump's supporters might come to the same conclusion. Well, there's no real crime. So, of course, he's going to behave that way. You had made the point he had other means that he, he could have gone to. Um, you know, he could have pointed out how they're after him. He had plenty of fodder for that. Um, so it wasn't as though he could have avoided obstructing justice and still made his point and been far more effective. That's, that's pretty much what I remember you saying. And I thought that, that made sense. That made sense to me, you know, because if you and I were in the similar situation, we might come out to the public and talk about how we're innocent. We might explain our side of things, try to present evidence to why we're innocent and that we feel like we're being sought after unfairly. But we wouldn't go about trying to undermine the FBI or the um, investigative agencies and their authority. And that's right. the difference here. I think yes. I know I know it's very difficult. Maybe you're hearing this now and you're like, well, isn't that obvious? But for some people, for a lot of people, that doesn't sink in right away. You know, um, all they hear is he's being treated unfairly because it's a crime he did not commit. So maybe he has a right to behave the way he's behaving, because what what is this recourse? What what options does he have before him? So it's right, only, yeah. Bob so it's Barr, only natural you know. for him to be angry. It's only natural for him to use the powers he feels he has within his means to go after something, you know, undermine them before they get him sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying that's the right way to go about it, but I understand why people might sympathize with him in that way. And I still don't think those people are reasoning honestly. They're just very tribal and highly inclined to follow him no matter what. But. Yeah, I think we just have to appeal to people's higher selves, uh, their higher sense of justice and understand this isn't that uh, Donald Trump is treated fairly or unfairly, but it is, as you pointed out, making sure justice is equal, it's blind, and that he had other means, but he chose the lower road to make his case. I mean, a, a commenter was talking about uh, impeachment and how, uh, like impeachment isn't going to do much, but it's, 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 it's not going to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will lay out the case against him more detailed for the American people. And that's the equity in impeachment. So that really hit home when I was like, oh, okay, yeah, it's going to be laid out. He's going to be tried in Congress. It's going to be, you know, Bob Mueller is going to testify. We're going mm -hmm. to hear this this open up in areas we haven't heard before. And that's going to be the value of impeachment going forward. But it also sets forth what Congress is supposed to do. It sets the duty is clear. Exactly. And any type of impunity always breeds lawlessness. So there's plenty of evidence that Trump plans to continue acting without regard for the law. And so this sets the presidents that no, you're not. This is it. This is this is it for you. You cannot go pass go. This is it. You are not immune to the law. Exactly. So they have no options other than to have to impeach. It would be remiss of them to do otherwise. Um, yeah, there's yeah, there's definitely they have to follow the Constitution. This isn't a political thing. It's just a, exactly it's a constitutional thing. So. Mm -hmm. so thoughts about Alabama's I think it's what, 21 what, conservative Republicans banned abortion. The only exception is if the mother's life is at risk. What are your thoughts on on that? OK, these are bills in separate states. Do right. they all have those stipulations attached 
No. Uh, most of the uh, other right. ones, as it relates to what they call uh, heartbeat bills, yeah. uh, some of them are eight weeks, uh, others are six weeks. Some of them do have exceptions that go beyond Alabama's, for example, as you just pointed out, rape and incest. Alabama is the most extreme case, so okay, it's, it's yeah. pretty draconian. And let me elaborate on a mm-hmm. broader picture. Um, the the abortion war that has just been launched the other day uh, mm-hmm. is a broader strategy going into 2020 mm-hmm. um, in, in the context that the Republicans don't have anything to offer. So they're going they're going two ways here. They're going two ways. Uh, the first way is the abortion route, the righteous indignation with abortion and uh, in, in playing that card. The other one will be the Iranian war drum. So you have fear mongering and warmongering uh, starting up going into 2020 campaign season um, like like Trump and the Republicans have nothing to offer. Okay, mm-hmm. They have nothing on health care. They have nothing on a living wage. They have nothing on uh, you know college debt. They have nothing on the issues. So mm-hmm. they're hedging their bets with with old standbys like right. abortion controversy. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, warmongering, okay? You know, socialism. Like, right, socialism. Uh, the Iranians are coming. They're going to steal a cooling pie off your shelf and whatnot. Just, this is red meat. They throw to their base when they have nothing. And they generally have nothing. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, however, I think they may have miscalculated this time. Awesome. Um, I think this is going to bring out much a higher proportion of female voters than we might have gotten otherwise if if it had not been for Alabama passing this draconian law. It's just ridiculous that a doctor who performs an abortion would get 99 years in prison. I think is it a woman also that is wanting an abortion, would she also be penalized? I'm pretty sure. I'm yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. Of course, they're wanting to overturn Roe versus Wade. I'm just trying to think about Donald Trump and his long-term strategy and why he's so set on this. Where in his mind has he calculated? He believes that the right way to go would be to side up with the evangelicals long-term. Why, why does he think that he has the power to resurrect them? Because you can see that through time they've been declining in their power. Right, right, yeah. It seems like an antiquated strategy with yeah. a diminishing base. I, I don't really understand it. Uh, I guess they're not too into a political strategy and nuance, but it, it just it just feels like Mike Pence is all over this one. Um, he thinks he can rally uh, the GOP base through, you know, a, a abortion and obviously, like I said, the Iranian war drum. Um, but, yeah, it seems like it's antiquated and out of date. Uh, and like you said, it could blow back in their face uh, and, and get women on the side of the Democrats, and even Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi, oh my God, Nancy Pelosi took a stance. Uh, What did she say? Oh my God, it was so amazing. She took a right, she took a right wing stance for abortion. She said, you shouldn't judge a presidential candidate based on their uh, abortion record or something to that effect. I was just stunned. I was blown away. That's how to play the media. He knows how to play people. Now, Everything smacks of religious undertones, let's just put it that way. It all plays into the same song and dance of the religious right, the fundamentalist, the evangelicals out of control, uh, all tied into Israel, uh, you know, the golden chosen people, and all the sinners that don't understand that they're chosen by God and that there has to be an Armageddon. Yep. Uh, and if everything's destroyed, it's God's plan because we're all going yep. to heaven. Yep. Uh, at least those that really have the light and see that this is what's happening. And what I find so ironic about this whole discussion is it's that same group that's always the anti-globalist. And yet they don't see that the deep state is the ones manufacturing war and hate and division. But they play right into it, just like that, just like right into that playbook. I don't know. I just don't get it. Why can't why can't they not see they're being played? I don't know. 
it's stunning. Do you have any family members that are part of that that mindset? My literal whole family is. Every mm. one of, I mean, 98% of my family are mm. staunch, far-right, libertarians and or conservatives uh, who are mostly all right-wing fundamentalist Christians as well. I mean, would you say they're dominionist? Where they think that, you know, Christians need to dominate the world, take it over, save everyone. Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, like uh, they won't come out right and say it, but they will mm -hmm. manifest the characteristics of uh, like uh, Christo fascism. Um, just being, you know, the whole abortion issue right now has just brought out all the Christo fascists uh, on my timelines. And I haven't talked to my family about it, but I try not to, to be honest. But, you know, like this is this is Christo fascism. Uh, Mike Pence is pushing Christo fascism uh, through these strict dark ages, uh, you know, abortion bans. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, they want to rule people. They want to rule um, whether they say it outright. It doesn't matter because the, the implications in their policies speak for them. Interesting. But they do. Do you believe that Donald Trump chewed off more than he bargained for or do you feel he's got this all under control and it's all unfolding according to his long-term design no not at all mm. people like donald trump thrive off off of chaos mm -hmm. uh, confusion moving the goalposts. Mm -hmm. um the, it's a perpetual world of chaos uh, it has to be. There's no other way. And then you sort it out afterwards. It's act now, sort it out later. That's his whole mentality in business. Mm. This, this mm. impulsive uh, mindset where it's just like, I do what I want now. Uh, I'll, I'll sort it out in court later. And he's doing that with the you know subpoenas and whatnot and everything. Mm -hmm. There is no grand strategy. There's a think on your feet strategy. Impulsivity. Very Exactly. And, and then sort it out later. Sort it after we he does what he wants and then it gets sorted out later. And this is a consequence of his own personal experience of never being held accountable to his exactly. actions and behaviors. OK, very scary stuff there. Totally. Um, and then so what we really have is maybe it is we that have gone asleep and had this idea that we were more evolved as a nation of people than we actually were. And all along, they've been planning behind the scenes. What do you feel? Do you feel like they this is a temporary sort of flash in the pan for them? Or do you feel this is a just the beginning of something much bigger and scarier to come? I, my prediction is that it will be, it will be a flash. Uh, you know, 2016... When you look at the numbers, half half the country didn't vote. Okay, mm -hmm. um, the midterms were the biggest midterms uh, in history. One of the biggest midterms in history. Um, and then you know, two, two years later, it'll be 2020. Obviously, from that point, I think it'll be built from there. I really think mm -hmm. there's going to be a backlash that will bring voters out. Um, you know, Hillary was going to win it. She was 80, 90 percent the whole time. No one showed up. Who cares? Hillary's going to win. There's no way this guy's going to win. So All there right. are some things like that going on that really kept people away. I really mm -hmm. think they're going to come out. I'd even say they're still going to come out if Joe Biden gets the nomination. God, but let's I hope think not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, I know. Yeah. No Biden. No, thank you. Do you think he really wants to win, though? I mean, what are your thoughts there? Do you think Joe Biden really wants to win? Yeah, I uh, I don't want to get too conspiratorial, but let's just speculate. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tim Black was talking about it, too. He said he uh, that, that Tim Black believes that Joe Biden doesn't want to be president. Hmm. And then they did talk a little bit about um, I wouldn't say conspiratorial. It could be conspiratorial or not, but like the thinning out the, the field. All right. By jamming so many candidates in there, and he's just one of 21. Um, uh, one of 21 candidates who are running for president, and if they can thin out the field enough to mm -hmm. where Bernie Sanders doesn't get over 50 percent of the delegates, that goes to the super delegates, right? And then they choose the, the candidate. So that's. I don't know. 
Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, definitely. I can see that. I, I've had that type of suspicion right up the beginning of the primary season when you had candidates coming out left and right. Uh, and further proof of that to me is that most of these candidates are not really campaigning. You know, they don't even have the numbers, you know, the donor, the donation numbers. Um, I was gonna say, yeah. they, uh, they're just getting in because of the, the poll numbers. You're right. There's at this point, unless Bernie Sanders is able to get at least 40 percent of the vote, there is no way he's going to be able to get the number of delegates needed in order to right. take the nomination. So there is at this point. Sure, as something miraculous, it will go to the second round. It will go to the second round, and it will be the superdelegates who will determine who will be the nomination. And I'm seeing a lot of people saying that's where we're going to lose, where progressives mm -hmm. are going to lose Bernie Sanders in that process because the superdelegates are firmly stacked against him. And they were in 2016, but even this time, I saw a list – and Cory Booker had the most or something. Kamala Harris had the most. Uh, Joe Biden. Like all these people are even, who aren't even polling well. Mm -hmm. Joe is okay. But like the superdelegates, I believe, are going to screw up everything again and just in another way. This corner, corner of my eye, I saw that within Congress, Cory Booker has received more endorsements from other Congress members than anyone else running at this time. Okay, yeah, that's strange, right? <laughs> Isn't that, that strange? Is, yeah, that is really strange. I mean, talking about not representing the American people. Now, we want to extend that to any progressive. I don't think it's just Bernie Sanders. It's just, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. Tulsi Gabbard, Andrew Yang, they just don't want, want them in. They don't want them right. in. They don't want Medicare for all. They don't want... $15 minimum wage. They don't really care about the environment. They, they want to be, do baby steps to, to the environment. Um, they really only care about social issues. You know, um, that's the only thing that would define them somewhat progressive. You know, they care about social issues, you know, like equal rights and things like that, which is great. But right. how can you have true equality and justice if you don't have economic environmental justice? Exactly. Exactly. So, but I want to ask you, Dave, what do you think would be the solution to that? Let's let's just speculate for a moment. Let's just presuppose that is really what they're doing. They're meaning to undermine a progressive getting the nomination. Is there anything due to stop that train? Drawing a blank. What could we do? Go to the streets. Raise hell. I mean, I... What do you do but protest? I'm thinking about we might come up with the petition of the people, the people's a petition. We need to get as many people as we can on the petition. Make some warning that if the superdelegates does not vote for the candidate that gets the most delegates or the most popular vote, then we, we are going to form a third party. We're going to go behind the Green Party. We're going to go uh, behind the People's Party. We're done. That we are. This is not a joke. It's not going to be like the Dim X of 2016. It's going to be an avalanche, something they've never seen before. Yeah. It will under. It will literally undermine. We will do everything in our power to destroy the Democratic Party. They will no longer exist. They will be decimated off the face of the earth. Scorched earth. Scorched earth approach. I mean, you know, we're of course all talking metaphorical. Um, not through violence, you know, Never. peaceful protest and petitioning and gathering of signatures and uh, essentially just committing to that we're we're exiting the Democratic Party. We're done with it. Yeah. Oh, it's it's over. We're finished. Yeah, yeah. We would have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. Uh, it's just two elections in a row. I mean, come on. Yeah, no. I think you laid it out pretty good. Like, get some get. Petitions. You'd have to have a certain amount of signatures. Uh, mm. You would definitely have to have some protests, though. Uh, mm, I see. You would definitely have to have protests. Okay. Um, yeah, for sure. Hey, you mentioned the Green Party. Mm -hmm. uh, someone was talking about, this is maybe a little off topic, uh, but the Green Party, should the Green Party bow out 
and support, let's say, Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, Andrew Yang, Mike Gravel, any of the more progressive candidates, uh, should the Green Party uh, pledge their support and not run a candidate and support the progressive if a progressive gets in? Like, 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 should Jill Stein run if Bernie Sanders is running? Yeah, I think that should be left up to them. Uh, it's okay. not our. What do you I don't feel it's our place to do that, to tell them what to do. You know, a true democracy is not trying to coerce or convince or persuade other people away from their vote. Just prevent, present the different options to them. I would okay. like that. I would love it if they see the benefit of taking that route. Um, it, ideal in the ideal situation, I think that would be a good thing. But you know, again, it's up. To, it's up to them. And I'm not, I, I wouldn't see them as spoilers or anything like that. You know, uh, everybody has a right to their vote. Exactly. So I don't think it would make a lot of difference, personally. I don't think Green Party is that significant this year. You know, not like it was in 2016 uh, when they received almost 2 million votes. I think this time around they might muster out 500,000, a million we have a lot of good candidates running this time around on, on the Democratic ticket. Right, true. There's a bigger, yeah, you have more choices for sure. Yeah, I just want to see what your take was on that. What is, what is your thought? Well, if it, I mean, coercion, you mentioned coercion. I mean, like if, if Bernie does run, let's say Bernie gets the nomination and I'm Jill Stein, I would likely do everything in my power to get Bernie, give Bernie momentum. Uh, I mean, is Jill Stein, the question is, is Jill Stein left of Bernie enough to be a viable option in this race, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be kind of like? Yeah, I don't think so, because uh, even she herself in 2016 was willing to step down if um, he came into the Green Party. She would just take VP. So I think she even realizes she's not. There's not a stark difference between Bernie Sanders and the Green Party, enough for right, her to exactly. run, run against him. So. So if Bernie was to run, why why pull votes out of uh, you know Bernie's momentum, you know? But like you said, you can't be coercion. There can't be all this, you know. I don't know. Like it's. We can certainly encourage. Yeah. We can certainly encourage them. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, we can just point out why we think it would be a good idea. Uh, although, if you know, you do decide to otherwise, we respect that decision. Something along those lines, I think, is fine. What else we got to work with? Um, do, you have an, do you have a comment about Mike Ravel or any news about Mike Ravel coming? Yeah, out? I mean, I'm kind of hearing unofficially that the deadline to re, to get the 65,000 needed unique individual donors has been moved to June the 12th. I believe he's up to nearly 40,000 last time I've heard. So we can still get him there. We've got about a good three weeks to just donate one dollar. We'll leave the link below. And if you haven't done so already, just highly recommend it. What do you think about Mike? Like, what what kind of um, um, how would you define Markville in a sentence or two as to why we should support him? Why we should support Mike Ravel is pretty easy. He's just another robust, uh, progressive voice to push the dialogue, uh, to push the debates into territories where we need to talk about, like. The environment, uh, like uh, being anti-war, anti-regime change, war, uh, economic freedom. Uh, he's just he's just another voice that's going to to pad the progressive voices in the field, um, and that's the value of Mike Ravel. Like I don't know if he's going to run. I just know he wants to make the debate stage, like 2008. He said he didn't mm -hmm. want to run for president. He just wanted to get on the debate stage. So he's the one that wants a national initiative uh, for the people to be able to vote on their own legislation. Right. Right, Dave. The okay, yeah, I think I remember something about that. Yeah. Yeah. And also he has set forth a dividend for all American citizens similar to what they have in Alaska. Uh, he wants to ban all nuclear weapons worldwide. He wants to end all wars. So he's just an incredible guy. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think he just uh, enriches uh, the 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 progressive dialogue that is needed in America today, 
And and if you watch any of his 2008. Uh, debate footage he calls out centrist he called out biden he called out obama he called out hillary on their warmongering and it's just it's good theater but he's 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 a truth teller he just cares about the truth and uh, calling people out and it's beautiful yep i've kind of noticed that bernie sanders has been numbers have been going down in the national polls now i don't trust all the national polls but we have been seeing a trend do you get the sense that his campaign in any way has waned over the past month or two? Why or why not? I mean, I, I can obviously I can only speculate. Um, and, and two two main things come up uh, in, in my speculations. Uh, one is Joe Biden announcing might steal some thunder. OK, that's mm-hmm. pretty logical, right? Uh, that Biden would scoop up a little bit of Bernie support. Um, so that's 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 reasonable. Another one, I, maybe a little further in reach, is Andrew Yang. Um, if you notice Andrew Yang's base, uh, they're very very young. They're predominantly young. So is, so is Bernie's. Um, and my speculation is that Andrew Yang could be pulling, hollowing out some of Bernie's support. Um, it, it's very likely. Um, obviously, we don't have the numbers to back it up. But I really think there's something going on there between Andrew Yang uh, siphoning uh, support via Bernie's base. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I've I've seen a number of uh, commenters on this channel, and I'm I'm sure you saw on your channel as well, Dave, that, um, you know, had stated, you know, I was a former Bernie Sanders supporter. Um, I was disappointed when he said he doesn't feel we're ready for the UBI. I feel that we are. I'm getting that's why I'm getting behind Yang. And I've also seen a couple of Trump supporters, you know, that are disenchanted with his war stance, his rhetoric. He's not keeping a lot of his promises. And uh, so they've come over to Yang that they feel that he's actually offering something that's tangible versus just a bunch of you know hot air by Trump. Just speculating here, let's say that it looks as though Yang is starting to uh, pull ahead from the other progressive candidates. Yeah. In your mind, each one of the progressive, other progressive candidate supporters, Marianne Williamson, Bernie Sanders, Tulsa Gabbard, uh, Mike Gravel, how confident are you that they will then go ahead and start supporting but Andrew Yang, presuming that Bernie Sanders drops out or whatnot? Elizabeth Warren drops out, so forth and so on. Do you feel that they would go ahead and get behind Andrew Yang, or do you feel that they would just not participate? Yeah, it's hard to just, tell. I mean, I, I think so, because it is it is there is a mission behind uh, this primary to beat Trump. It's not just about the issues, uh, which we stay yeah. focused on a lot. There is a goal. So I believe if Andrew Yang is to be the candidate, other primary candidates will coalesce around Andrew Yang. I, I, okay. I don't see that being an issue. Okay, so you feel those supporters would get behind him for the most part? Oh, yeah. For the okay. most part, absolutely, yes. Just because, okay. not just because of what he's offering, but also because the larger scope, uh, the large role of defeating Trump, and we all mm-hmm. have to get behind who's going to be the candidate. We're supposed to. I'm just saying we're supposed okay. to. Mm-hmm. But if it's Andrew Yang, I, I, I see him getting garnering a lot of support. OK. And this, can the same case be made for the other progressive candidates, uh, Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard? Let's say Bernie Sanders starts pulling ahead. Do you feel Andrew Yangers would come over for the most part? Gabbard supporters would come over for the most part, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, like if I, I see a lot of those people have similar trajectories similar similar rhetorics uh, rhetoric mm-hmm. similar policies um so i i don't see why there would be a problem uh if you know if a progressive candidate like andrew yang i can see them following another progressive candidate like mike Ravel, bernie sanders or tulsi gabbard just the mm-hmm. same uh okay. just because the ideology the policy it's pretty much the same path okay I feel like Andrew Yang is a mirroring of Bernie Sanders in that Bernie Sanders is ready for Medicare for all and he's going full force behind that. But he's not. He's tippet on UBI. 
he doesn't feel we're quite ready for it. It might be five, ten years from now. I'm just kind of putting words in his mouth, but just speculating. Andrew Yang is on the flip of that. He's totally ready for UBI, but he's more tippet about when we're going to get to Medicare for all. But they're really on the same page. They just have sort of a different pathway to get us there. And what, what they feel takes precedence at this moment in our history. Exactly. And if one of them gets in there, I'm sure the other one would be up for consideration in a cabinet or yeah, I something like that. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely see that happening with the people we just mentioned here with Tulsi, Bernie, Yang. Uh, you know, I can see them working together in some capacity. Okay. And I know that a number of newer um, supporters of UBI have popped up. Um, Tulsi Gabbard mentioned it on the Joe Rogan show that she's more serious about taking on UBI. She's looking through the details of that. Marianne Williamson made it known on RT America that she supports UBI after she read Andrew Yang's book. I think Elizabeth Warren mentioned it in passing, as did Kamala Harris. We know Bernie Sanders already uh, is open to UBI and supports it, just a matter of when the timing's right. Uh, Who are we missing? Mike Avell, he has a form of a dividend so everybody, at least in the progressive camps, is in for that. So That's interesting. Like, is there anybody in the centrist Democrat camp uh, talking or promoting UBI in any capacity? No, nope. absolutely not. I want to ask you, though, what do you make of the right somehow being more open to Andrew Yang in general, at least corporate media? than is the left. What, what's that all about in your mind? Why, you mean, why he's, is he connecting with the right so much? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely he's been welcomed onto Fox News several times. They've treated him mainly, for the most part, they've treated him pretty decently, Taco Carlson. Um, but yet when he goes over to the left, they're not quite as open to him. And they're, they kind of... Uh, you know, mistreat him. Not just Andrew Yang, but also Tulsi Gabbard. Like, what's that all about for you? Like, what does that mean? Hmm. Yeah, what's there? There's an appeal there uh, for Andrew Yang on the right and Tulsi Gabbard too. Uh, I, I think. I mean, the right likes straight shooters. Uh, people okay. even they don't even have to be straight shooters. They have to give the impression they're a straight shooter. Trump is a perfect example of someone who appears like he's giving you the straight dope. But he's a total con artist, right? Okay. I think the right appreciates somebody who is honest. Um, And what I get from Andrew Yang, especially, is he's very honest and he believes in what he's saying. And he's not, I don't like, he's not partisan. He's not really, I don't know, but usually they like that stuff. So maybe that's not right. Well, there's a word for it. I know what you're talking about uh, is when they use, um, you know, social justice type language. SJW. Uh, SJW. And I know that uh, those on the right don't like that. But I just want to throw at you some of the comments I've, I've heard people make. One is some people are commenting that they think it might be Fox News attempting to split the, the split the vote to undermine Bernie Sanders. So they want to give Tulsi Gabbard and they want to give Andrew Yang airtime for the ends that they they feel that will somehow siphon votes away from Sanders and get Biden in, which they think he's a pushover and would be easily defeatable by Trump. Fox News wants to help split that vote up. Right. Okay. Some of one some of the comments I've seen. It's a conspiracy. I'm not putting it above Fox News, uh, considering the element that they are, which is very disingenuous, very partisan, very Mm. just disgusting in a lot of ways. So I wouldn't put it above them. Uh, But I I think there are some there's some right wing appeal with Tulsi uh, because there's a a staunch libertarians who watch Fox Mm. News and Tucker. I think I think Tucker is a libertarian. Uh, And the anti-war message lands hard on the right side of the spectrum with libertarians. So that Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, Andrew Yang's UBI uh, is is basically a right-wing version of UBI Mm -hmm. if we had to categorize it. So I think they even gravitate to that. And obviously those two candidates are straight shooters as well. Uh, So 
you know, they have right wing appeal, just like Bernie does. Bernie's a populist uh, who has appeal on both sides. They know a straight shooter. They know somebody. The right has the ability to recognize straight shooters. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's why they are genuinely gravitating to some of these progressive candidates. Uh, but like you said, is there something nefarious going on? Is there a conspiracy here for them to, to interfere? It's a stretch, but not out of the realm of possibility. What I've noticed is Andrew Yang has been picking up a lot of right wing endorsements, you know, uh, Ben Shapiro. I mean, I wouldn't say they're formal endorsements, but they definitely have given them shout outs, invited them on to their, their platforms, have very little negative to say about them, doesn't really challenge them. Uh, that much, uh, but uh, like Ben Shapiro, uh, Adam Carolla, Fox News, like you just mentioned, T- Tucker Carlson, creates this this atmosphere that people think Andrew Yang is a libertarian, that he's just in and on with them, um, that, are, that this is why Fox News is attracted to him. Uh, what do you think about Andrew Yang? You did already mention that you felt his UBI was more of a right-wing version is that yeah. is that a justifiable consideration or thought or statement? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Andrew Yang is is also very pro capitalist. Um, so it's mm-hmm. like I think we give him more credit being a progressive than than we should. Um, okay. Like, so Andrew Yang is you know he's a pro business capitalist. Uh, and obviously, that's going to resonate on the right side of the political spectrum. They're going to gravitate to that, um, as they would with any other right-wing Democrat, like Joe Biden, or you know, uh, I don't know, Pete Buttigieg, maybe. I don't know. Like, you see, for me, I don't really believe that his UBI is the problem uh, for a lot of people. It, I think it's more that he is lacking. Uh, in social programs, he is lacking uh, in uh, what to do about Social Security. You know, I see nothing on his website about Social Security. I see mm. nothing on his website about social welfare programs. Um, you know, and I, so I can see why that gives people pause, you know, some, com- some concern. If he had, you know, sort of brought these out more, then maybe... People wouldn't feel, you know, get the the um, suspicion that he's looking to undermine those. I mean, if you look at uh, even the sunset clause, sunset all old laws or something like like UBI, Andrew Yang's UBI. I believe that he believes it's such a it's it's such an umbrella. Like there's so many things to put under this UBI umbrella that he just doesn't unpack. Uh, the details uh, that that we want or we might want. Uh, UBI is such a, a um, it, it's such a blanket over so many things. Like he uses it for so much context. In that's why he doesn't bother to go into so many things. I just think he just falls back on his UBI. UBI is going to cover X, Y, and Z, and you don't have to worry about anything else because you have UBI. It's kind of general, but I think his UBI is like, uh, you know, it's a safe space for him to not talk about other things uh, in detail. Yeah, some people just are suggesting he's a libertarian Trojan horse, you know. Omissions. Do you believe he has omissions? (laughs) Yeah, omissions that just are kind of glaring. I like everything else. I mean, I really do. I think, and there's a couple of other things, too, like his... uh, Fake news, rampant problem. He says here, imbue the FCC with the new office of the news and information ombudsman, whose role it will be to investigate complaints of deliberate, persistent, and destructive misinformation published by media companies and on social media, with the particular priority of curbing any foreign actors posing as citizens. I don't know. And then he mentions Russia in here a couple of times. Uh, this is particularly problematic given that foreign actors, particularly Russia, into, intend to do us harm and capitalize on our freedom of information. I just don't know why he needs to mention Russia. Why can't he just say anyone, including the United States, who has a long history of interfering with elections? 
he singled out Russia. I don't know. Maybe they're because of the most recent uh, uh, violators. I don't know. It just smells of him falling into the whole Russiagate thing. You know, mm. is it really that big of a deal? Do you feel that they're polluting our dialogue to the degree that he's suggesting? I mean, it's, you know, it's like, yeah. how, how can you even control something like that? You know, how, how are you yeah. able to dictate who can put what on Twitter? And, you know, short of violence and pornography and child uh, molestation and all that stuff. Of course, we get that. But right. short of those things, people have opinions. Yeah, but I mean, I think he's got a, a huge number of great progressive policies. I think UBI would definitely help... Uh, huge swaths of people it will essentially transform the way we think about our relationship to work uh, the way we understand our economy going into the age of automation you can see more candidates coming on board recognizing the benefit of ubi even if it's not his version he started the dialogue and that's just massive you know that's you know, that's groundbreaking so in my mind, he'll always be, you know, someone that is revolutionary. Absolutely. I fully agree. Well, I guess that about wraps up another episode of Progressive Talk. And this was episode six. Joshua, let's do it again next week. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you on, on the flip side. Have a good week. Take care.